Few writers are as prolific as novelist John Sanford, penning over 50 books, and even fewer can claim to have received the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. Winning the coveted honor in 1986 for his series on the Midwest farm crisis was the beginning of the end for the former newspaper reporter. You know, the transition to novel writing wasn't easy, but it was probably easier than it would be for most newspaper writers because I, I was used to that kind of longer form stuff and building characters and so on. Sanford, whose real name is John Camp, called from his years as a crime reporter to create characters Lucas Davenport and Virgil Flowers. Fans have followed them since Sanford's first published novel, Rules of Prey, in 1988, followed by the Kid and Virgil Flowers series. They're the kind of people that I actually encountered when I was reporting. Uh, and all those stories, uh, hundreds of them, uh, are just kind of stuck in your head. Much of his work is edited by his wife, Michelle Cook, a screenwriter. Together, they co-authored three young adult novels. Sanford's latest book, Ocean Prey, is his 31st in what fans recognize as the Prey series. U.S. Marshals Davenport and Flowers find themselves in South Florida, investigating the death of three members of the Coast Guard who are killed while checking out a suspicious boat. I'm the deputy chief of police for the city of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I love my work. Two of Sanford's novels have been made into movies, but they get a poor review from the author. They, they just weren't very good. What can you say? People don't believe me. They never believe me when I say this, but I don't care. If somebody wants to give me a lot of money to make a movie, that's fine with me. And Michelle, my wife, is the opposite. She would love to do a big screen movie. Sanford does not mince words and is an open book on his website, sharing his thoughts and answering questions from his loyal fans. Welcome, and thank you for joining us virtually. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Well, I want our viewers and listeners to know that you have a connection to Missouri, that you worked for the Southeast Missourian early in your career at, in Cape Girardeau. Yeah, I did. I worked there for two years, and uh, I was a reporter, and I did some photography for them. And I've also set a couple of books in St. Louis. Well, you know, like another one of my contacts with the St. Louis area is in 1980, I paddled a canoe from the top of the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico by myself. And I came through St. Louis and I actually spent a few days there getting my head back together after that long trip down. So uh, the Mississippi River has been really important in my life and uh, I like the whole valley. I just, that's one of the great places in the world, I think. I can't imagine seeing the, well, going down the river and seeing it from that perspective. That was quite uh, adventuresome to say the least, if not dangerous. Well, but it was, and, and a lot of people don't realize it, but you get down south of St. Louis and there are huge miles and miles of white sand beaches uh, that, that are sort of like, you know, Southern France or, or, or Fort Lauderdale, uh, but you can't get to them because they're on, uh, you know, you've got the, you've got the levee on, on one side back and you can't get across the levee and, and the swamp that's behind the levee, you can't get over there to the beach, but there are huge beaches there, so. That's fascinating that you've done that. And I, can, I know that you, you were devoted to your writing and you talked about how uh, long you, you know, your day-to-day -day workings, but you do have other things you do like to enjoy. You said you do diving. Um, what else do you like to do um, that is creative or, or not? Well, I, I, I know you own a bunch of guns too, don't you? Isn't that yes, you? Yeah. I paint. This, this is one of my paintings behind me that I'm working on right now. Uh, and uh, I also play guitar. And uh, I take guitar lessons. And uh, so, so I do all that stuff. And I've got some guns. And I go out and shoot with friends every once in a while. I don't actually like guns. I, I like guns because I've had them around all the time. But this gun culture, I don't like. The, I know. I got it. The heavy uh, duty. But, but you're writing about guns. Yeah. In every book. <laughs> so. That's a conflict for me. That really is a conflict because yeah. because guns are so important in my books. But then, just today, uh, I guess yesterday, there were another eight or nine people killed in Indianapolis uh, by a guy with a gun, and and uh, this is this is absurd. So. 
It's, it's a sign of the time, sadly. When you look back into your times of journalism, and we mentioned the Pulitzer Prize that you, you did for future reporting on the farmers, you followed a farming family for a year in Minnesota, Southwest Minnesota. Um, was that a turning point for you in your journalistic career that you thought, man, I, I guess I can write and feature reporting at that? Well, actually, that was the end of my journalism career. Right, that's, yes, I, right. So that was the end of it. But that's, was that the impetus to go into, you know, your 31st novel, Ocean Prey, years later? I mean, did you even think that would be, was that even in your goals or dreams? Well, I, you know, the thing is that I always wanted to write novels. I, I mean, I, I, way back from when I was in college. But uh, the real impetus was that I had... Uh, a wife and two kids all who wanted to go to the University of Minnesota at the same time. And uh, when I won the Pulitzer, people tend to think if you win the Pulitzer, you're sort of set for life. Uh, I got a $50 a week raise. So that was like $2,500 at a time when it cost $12,000 a year to go to the University of Minnesota. So I had to find a way, uh, you know, and uh, to make more money and uh, my skill set was writing. So uh, I decided to push the novel writing pretty hard. Uh, the first novel I wrote didn't get published because uh, it wasn't any good. And uh, so it was like a practice novel, but then the second one I wrote did get published. I've got a question about the title because I'm gonna tell you, this is my first book I read, Ocean Prey, and it was, it was good as a standalone. However, I'm guessing your fans would cringe at me saying that because they followed you from Rules of Prey. You know, they're following that through the whole series, your main characters, Lucas Davenport and Virgil Flowers. I mean, it's people, people know it. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you, do you find you get new people like me to kind of go, oh, I want to go back and, and see their whole journey? Is that how it would flow? Well, they do. I think a lot of my fans uh, have been with me the whole trip. And uh, especially up in Minnesota, because, you know, like I was a hometown guy there. You were also a columnist in the paper there, correct? Yes, I was. I was yeah. a columnist for a while. Right. Uh, but that wasn't really my natural thing for me to do. I, it turns out I didn't have enough opinions, actually. Uh, I was more of just like a reporter reporter. So I did a lot of police stuff and I did a lot of, uh, you know, feature writing and, and uh, cultural stuff. I did a lot of stories on American Indians. I did a story... Uh, you know, that, that uh, wandered around the state and did a lot of strange stuff, uh, mostly features. You know, the transition to novel writing wasn't easy, but it was probably easier than it would be for most newspaper writers because I, I was used to that kind of longer form stuff and, and uh, uh, you know, building characters and so on. I have a question about the name having the word prey, P-R-E-Y. Did you know with Rules of Prey that that was gonna become the first of a series and you were always gonna use that title? Well, the thing is, is, that when, uh, is, is that I wrote another book that was actually sold before Rules of Prey. Uh, it was in a different series for a different company. And that's why my name is Sanford. My real name is John Camp. Uh, my Sanford, uh, I was gonna name, use my mother's maiden name, which was Baron. Uh, but it turned out there's already a John Barron writing books. And so I had to, so it's my grand, great grandfather's name. But in any case, I'd written another book. And uh, when I wrote this one, they took a look at it and said, you know what, uh, let's, have a, let's have a two book contract. You're gonna have to write a second book in this series if you, wanna, if you wanna sell the book to us. And that was fine with me. I mean, that was great with me. I, you know, I really wanted to do it. And they offered me quite a bit of money for it. So. Uh, so I got, uh, you know, you I started paid for those college tuitions. <laughs> paid the college tuition, and I got. Uh, uh, so I had the two book contract, and um, at that point, you know, they were going so well. The first book made it onto the bestseller list, the New York Times bestseller list, as a paperback, and so it was going well enough that they then wanted a three book contract. So then I'd get the five books, and at that point, it just went. But, but going back to the word prey, P-R-E-Y, um, was that intentional then all the way through? I had nothing to do with the title. Gotcha. I, I, you know, I don't even know what my original title was. I sent it with a title. They said that title's no good. And uh, so, uh, so they had somebody who, you know, who specialized in coming up with titles that came up with the rules of prey thing. Because the, the reason that the rules is, is because the original killer would send letters to the to the to the police, and he said, "You're never going to catch me because I follow these rules that will keep you away from me." So that's where the rules of prey came from. 
And now, 50 books, 53 books, I think, later, um, they told me that uh, my suggested title for my newest book, which I finished on Monday of this oh, wow. week. Congratulations. <laughs> That, that my title was no good, that they were gonna to have to come up with another title for it. Wow. Um, my main character in most of these books is a guy named Lucas Davenport. Lucas has a daughter who's really tough. And so I wrote a book about her. She's 24 and uh, so she's a young woman. And um, I wanted to call it Predator, sort of a riffing on the whole prey idea of the other books. And I said, eh, it's not gonna work. And uh, so they're gonna call it the investigator, I think. Oh, very good. So you're kind of branching away from it, but yet Lucas will be part of that. He's mentioned, but that's mentioned. Fine. Interesting. All right. And let's talk about Lucas Davenport and Virgil Flowers. So you start with them and we follow them along in these 31 books in this 31 series. Is there a little bit of you in him or is it somebody you've modeled him after? Or is he just a figment of your imagination? He's not a figment of the imagination. There's not much of me in there. Um, the, the one thing that I use myself as a model for is we are the same size. We are the same height. Um, and uh, when we started, we are the same age. But now Lucas is, I, I'm now 30 years older and Lucas is only seven years older because of the way that time works in the books. But I only did that, the, the, the same height, same coloration, same eyes, because then I don't have to worry about remembering it. I can, it'll always be the, always be right. And I, I don't use a, a figment of my imagination because that sounds like something that's kind of out there. I, he's very carefully constructed. I mean, I, I thought about him for a long time, uh, especially after my first book was not accepted. Yeah. Uh, I thought, you know, I actually sat down and thought, what do you have to do to make these characters? And what you have to do is you have to construct them very carefully. So, so Lucas is, kind of a tall, rugged guy. Uh, he's sort of a man's man, but he likes women a lot. And, yes. and uh, he sort of has a history of chasing women. And so uh, at least uh, until he gets married. Uh, and then, uh, so that's one thing I did. And then um, eventually I made him rich uh, because I think that that gave him more flexibility. In other words, what I was trying to do is I was trying to create a character that people would like. And, and uh, a lot of uh, authors, especially new authors, often create main characters that people don't like because they think that that's going to give him some kind of, uh, you know, uh, solidity, some kind of quality that's, a, that's interesting as opposed to attractive. Interesting, you know, he's a really tough guy and he's, you know, he's violent and all these kinds of things. And then he turns out to be, you know, people say he's a jerk. You know, he's not, he's not a very attractive character. I wanted people to like Lucas. And uh, even though he has a violent streak, so. Uh, right, and you, you intimate that in this last book, Ocean Prey. Let's set that up for our, for our viewers and listeners regarding the uh, a synopsis of it. So they, Lucas and Virgil find themselves working together again, but frankly, uh, Virgil's underwater <laughs> through a lot of it. Yeah, the basic story is, uh, uh, without getting into any, any, uh, anything that would spoil the book, uh, right. It starts out with a Coast Guardsman who sees what he thinks is a suspicious situation out on the ocean outside, outside Fort Lauderdale. It's right on the coast. Uh, he's fishing off the coast in his own boat, not a Coast Guard boat. And he sees a, a boat, an expensive boat coming fast down the coast and all of a sudden it stops. And it seems to, for, to him, because there's some distance away, that it's picking up a diver that was in the ocean with no flag, with nobody around, nothing there. And it seemed to be suspicious. Then the boat takes off in a hurry and it's going into the cut that leads into Fort Lauderdale from the, from the uh, outer edge. It's like an island out there. It goes into Port Everglades at Fort Lauderdale. Well, he calls up his duty officer uh, and says, you ought to check this boat. Uh, so what happens is when they check the boat, uh, uh, three Coast Guardsmen get killed by the people on the boat that they're chasing. And it turned out that they were pulling up behind a drug runner's boat. And they didn't understand that. And they wound up getting killed because of it. And so that's what happens. And then um, the FBI investigates because it's Coast Guard's been killed and the FBI is not getting very far because they're not very well set up for this kind of investigation. 
And that's how my character, Lucas Davenport, who was a US Marshal, not, a, not an FBI man, gets introduced to the situation. Right. And it's a great read. And as, from what I gather with your fans, they, you can go pretty quickly through. I mean, it's, it's one of those page turners, always wanting to get through it. Who are your fans too, John? I, you're an open book uh, because I went on your website and basically things I wanted to ask you, I'm like, well, there, your son was asking you and all the different videos you have. So obviously you get asked a lot of questions from fans over the years and why not since what, the, the 1980s, I'm sure that's happened a bit. Um, who, who are they and have they changed through the years? It's hard to tell because, because uh, you know, books aren't bought quite the same way a lot of other things are done where you have any kind of identification, but my sense of it is that most of my readers are female. Uh, I would say probably 60%, but that's true with most books, that, that women read books more than men do. Um, I think that I appeal mostly to sort of a middle-aged reader type of group of people who, uh, you know, I, I would suspect 40s to 40s on up. Uh, I think that, that, uh, that younger people actually don't read long books as much as older people do. And, uh, and I would like to attract more. Now, the, we'll see what happens with this new book, with a, with a book about Davenport's daughter, because that is somewhat aimed at a little bit younger. But I, I, I kind of think even there, it's going to be the same group of people. I mean, I, I just have a kind of a pretty loyal group of fans and, uh, that I talk to in, on the net and in person. And uh, so that's what it is. So the criminals and all some of these storylines, do you go to... Uh, do you watch the news for, for these types of stories? Do you kind of go to police blotters or if they even have those anymore? I mean, how do you get these ideas? Because to, to write so many books uh, quite often, you know, almost what, not, not one a year, but close to it. Uh, that's a lot of creativity. And do you, and also in an addendum, do you feel the stress of that or is it a pleasure? The thing is, is that I, I was a newspaper reporter and did a lot of police stuff for so many years. I mean, I did it for from the time I went into the army, the army sent me to journalism school. And so I went into the army when I was 22 and I stopped reporting when I was 20, when I was 47. So, you know, 25 years. Most of that is kind of hardcore reporting. Uh, I did longer form stuff. I did a lot of police stuff. Uh, so I've got all these stories kind of in my head. And uh, I, I also have a lot of stories that are kind of unusual police stories in that they involve stupidity. Um, the, my, my villains are not super villains. They're not, uh, you know, they're not geniuses. Uh, uh, I mean, some of them are pretty smart, but most of them are not. They are people who are just sort of workaday criminals. They, you know, they've been in prison. They're going to go back to prison some days. They shoot people. They don't. And, uh, and so they're the kind of people that I actually encountered when I was reporting. Uh, and all those stories, hundreds of them, uh, are just kind of stuck in your head. What's interesting, I found at the end of the book, when it says about the our notes from the author, you are very self-deprecating because you pretty much say, you know, my brother-in-law points out that I mentioned a, the wrong kind of gun for certain another story or another book that you've written. And then you talk about um, basically, hey, some things may not be exactly right. So kind of back off in so many words. Um, I, 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 do you do that for every book? <laughs> No, I only did it for this one. And the, and the, the fact is, I, is that over the years now with all these books, mistakes have crept in. Some of them are typos. Uh, some of them are mistakes. And, uh, and some of them uh, are accidental. And I just wanted to explain that. Uh, and I wanted to explain it in this book because this book has a lot of diving in it. And uh, Virgil Flower spends a lot of time in the water. And, and diving is a very technical thing. Did I read that your neighbor is a diver and you got a lot of information from him? Yes, and I also dive. And, and, uh, and so, uh, but I don't dive like he does. He has been everywhere in the world diving. But the thing is, is that when you dive, you've got all these numbers you've got to deal with. I mean, they're just really intense numbers. And, and uh, you know, like how long have you been down? How deep have you gone? How long did you stay? How long is it going to take you to go back up? Because you've got to decompress. If you've been down there too long, you've got to know how much gas you've got left, how much air you've got left. And it was important to the story, too. I will say that, John. Uh, very important because um, this guy's putting his life on the line uh, to catch these, catch the bad guys. 
Yeah, and 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 so and so when you have all that kind of information, things get screwed up. That's what it comes down to. And I just wanted to say, you know, I know these things, but but sometimes uh, sometimes the error is creeping, and you don't really even know where the error came from. Sometimes. So from your first rules book, Rules of Prey, to the latest one, Ocean Prey, has your writing changed at all through those years? I think it has. It's become smoother, but it might have become somewhat less interesting, actually. Uh, the, the, the thing is, is that you have, and in that first book, I worked on it so intensely. I mean, I worked on it just, and, and now, because they want one book a year, the Davenport, and then I was also doing another second book a year, so for 12 years, I was writing two books a year. Um, you're doing it faster. And I tried to slow down with uh, the Letty book that I just finished. Um, and I tried to put a, a lot of that early feeling into it where I was spending much more time actually looking at the landscapes that I was describing. Um, this, the, the new book that I just finished is set down on the border in uh, West Texas, right on the, the Mexican border. Uh, that's where a lot of the action takes place, and and so I went there, and you know, like a lot of the, a lot of the feeling and character of a book for me, comes from reported, uh, from looking at actually what you're going to be talking about. So aside from going to the location, like to get inspiration or maybe, um, and get more details, uh, what is your typical day of writing like? Uh, I mean, most people at this point in their, where you are in life, would be retired and say. Okay, I don't need to make do two books a year, but obviously you love it. Um, but but what's it like? What's your day like? Well, you know, it's uh, it's sort of like a newspaper day, uh, except that it's shorter and it's a little bit more intense because I'm not doing, I'm not making any phone calls. I'm not talking to people. I don't have people around me. I've got a little space that I sit in, not a big space at all. And I uh, uh, work probably three or four hours a day but I work almost every day of the year. If I don't work someday, I feel bad about it. And I feel like you also kind of lose the thread. So when I was writing two books a year, uh, just about every day for about four hours. And are, are there some pros and cons? I mean, you've written a lot of books, most of the books by yourself, but with the Virgil Flowers, don't you collaborate with someone else on those, right? Correct. I, I have collaborated. Uh, I, I collaborated on about half of them. And, so what, so how, does, how do you, so working in your space, how does that, uh, is there a pro and con to working with someone else? Is it more difficult, easier? What, what do you find? It's more difficult. Right. Uh, one of the things that we did was, is that I would sign up my collaborator. Uh, who my collaborators were, were my, were my uh, newspaper friends and one golfing buddy that I had. Uh, what I would do, uh, they were all smart people. And I would, I would tell them a year ahead of time, let's collaborate. And, uh, and then we would split the money 50-50. And what I was doing is that this was a way for these folks to get a nice chunk of cash before they retired because they were all about coming up to retirement age. You know, and so it worked out for them. But what I would do is I'd tell them a year ahead of time and I'd say, okay, let's spend the next year talking about it. And so we would talk about it and they would come up with ideas and scenes and places and that kind of stuff. And so by the time I got finished talking to them, we would have sort of a full outline of the book and then I would write it. They didn't actually do the writing. So I was still back there in the room by myself writing the book, but I had this big stack of paper of research that they had done and work that they had done on it. And in one case, uh, a guy named Larry Millette wrote a book that he did not get published. It was, I think it was his first effort to write a novel. But I looked at it and I thought, you know, I can remodel this novel and kind of change things around. And that became the first virtual novel. And uh, Larry has then gone on to write 10 or 15 pieces of fiction himself. And, uh, oh, you know, you're, you've been out there, you're established, you've been very successful. Uh, you got a Pulitzer Prize with your name uh, there as well for feature writing. What advice do you give writers starting out? I'm sure you get inundated by or with your fans. Hey, I've got my son or my daughter and what do you suggest? So when they say this, what, what is your answer? Well, one of the things that, that, uh, that new writers don't really understand is first of all, how hard it is. And, and uh, cause it is hard. But the other thing is that you have to learn how to write novels. And that's what newspaper reporters don't do. A lot of them have the skills to do it, but they are used to working in a situation where they write for the day and then they're finished. They go home, the story's done, it's gone by. 
But if you're writing a novel, it's going to take you a year. And that, and you've got to write every day, just like you are at work. But then you have to learn how to do it. You have a lot of things to think about. And a lot of people just kind of sit down and they write chapter one and they start typing and that, that's not going to work. Uh, you have to actually think about all these stuff. You got to think about your characters. Um, and like I said, a lot of writers, especially new ones, will start out with a character that's unlikable. You just don't like them. You have to, you have to think about it. And, and frankly, I think that most thriller writers, many of them are former newspaper reporters, uh, have uh, go through this learning experience. I mean, you might have a lot of writing experience in your past, but you need to learn how to write the books. And, and I think most of them uh, are thriller readers so that you learn the conventions of the genre, you learn you know, uh, what you do and what you can't do, and, and you learn weird stuff. For example, I don't have any extensive sex scenes in my books, even though Davenport really liked women. There are no longer sex scenes in my book, not because I'm embarrassed by sex scenes, but because it slows the book down. You can't have a really, you can have a really fast sex scene and that's fine. So, you know, you say that Lucas and his girlfriend jumped in the shower and got all soaked up and so on, and, and, then, and then stop. Just, you know, you don't get into the, to, to the all, you know, you leave that to the lady writers who are writing romance novels and, you know, those kind of steamy romances, and, which I respect. That's, a, that's a, another genre that's, that's quite good, but, but, the, but it, the books move slower. If you're writing a thriller, one of the main characteristics is speed. Right. have velocity and a, and, a, and a sex scene just stops it. So, so you learn things like that by reading the genre, um, you know, and, and, and uh, that's how you do it. So John, working with your wife as strong as she is, and probably I have a feeling you're very strong and set in your ideas. It was not always a match made in heaven. I'm sure there were a few discussions. <laughs> there were a lot of discussions because she's <laughs> She's a very good writer on her own. And the first time she wrote a screenplay, it was made into a movie. That does not happen very often. And so we got into these, uh, it was a trilogy actually. And, and uh, <laughs> we had a lot of serious discussions about it because we, our, our styles do not necessarily match up. She's much more intense than I am. And she wants to go over every word four times. And, and I am stuck with a velocity thing where I want things to go quickly. Okay. So that was a big difference. Yeah. That's interesting. I think it's fascinating. I know that you're you're a fans of and anyone who's wanting to be a writer would appreciate what you have to say. Now, a couple of your books have become movies, television. I think on the small screen. Did you like that process, or was that something you don't want to repeat? People don't believe me. They never believe me when I say this, but I don't care. If somebody wants to give me a lot of money to make a movie, that's fine with me. But I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to. I don't want to meet. The producers. I don't want to meet the stars. I don't want to meet anybody. I don't want to go to Hollywood. I don't want to go any place uh, because I'm a book writer. And I and I, and and Michelle, my wife, is the opposite. She would love to do a big screen movie, but the uh, the two books of mine that were made into TV movies, they sort of sucked. They were not very good. And and I say that you're very frank about it, and you just did it now. But yes, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they, just, they they just weren't very good. What can you say? Well, John Sandberg, thank you, or Sanford, thank you so much. It's an inspiration to hear from you and hear that you can still in your 70s be active and, uh, and keep the mind active and, and your health as well by uh, trying different things. I love that, it's an inspiration. And I want to remind our viewers, listeners that you can pick up John's latest book, Ocean Prey at Left Bank Books, one of our fine uh, independent bookstores. So please go and patronize and help out our small business owners in St. Louis. So John Sanford, thank you so much. And we'll be looking uh, not only for Ocean Prey that just came out, uh, but the ones that's coming out a year from now too. So thank you. Hey, thank you for having me. I enjoyed the talk.